from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Doug Jardine with his periodic update on diseases at work in our Kansas row crops. Among other things, he'll highlight two conditions now turning up in young corn stands, bacterial leaf streak and root lesion nematodes. Also today, from the Land Use Survey Center here at K-State, Leah Sudel will talk about the just-released 2019 Kansas Blue Stem Pasture Report, an annual survey of pasture management practices, which provides important benchmarks for grazing managers in the state. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee on the livestock and wildlife damage caused by feral dogs in Kansas. All this and more directly ahead on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, you're doing an update on disease problems in our row crops, principally corn today, and a quick word about soybeans as well. As you might imagine, with our weather patterns, so far the early growing season, diseases abound in various forms and fashions. And so we bring in once again row crop disease specialist Doug Jardine of K-State Research and Extension. So general overview here, Doug, on corn, do we see quite a few pathogens getting after it right now? Well, Eric, uh, I was out uh, a few days ago and and surveyed down through the south central part of the state and then kind of through the Kansas River Valley over over almost to the state line. You know, in general, the corn's looking pretty good. I mean, from a disease standpoint, yes, we've got corn that varies from V1 to VT, so that's a a pretty wide gap. But honestly, I was quite surprised by the low levels of gray leaf spot in most fields. Where I could find it, it was on the very lowest leaves. That's even in some fields that I know have a history of problems with the disease. Those same fields this year, not so much to this state, but again, we were a long way from tasseling in a few of those fields. And so I guess kind of the word I put out uh, after that is, you know, it's present, so we need to be scouting. But at this point, I was really not in any fields personally that I think we're going to need a fungicide this year. And given the commodity prices, if we can save 15 to 25 dollars that's probably going to be a good thing so why the noticeable absence of gray leaf spot this year well you know that's a that's a good question and i, I i'm not quite sure why uh that's a disease that's generally favored by cloudy days and, and 80 degree temperatures when we've had rain they've been big rains but they, they come and go pretty fast so maybe it's just a lack of continuous rain continuous clouds um i'm, I'm not quite sure now we've got some really hot temperatures and uh It's a little bit of a mystery. I would like to believe that growers are just planting hybrids that have more gray leaf tolerance in them because that's what we've preached as the primary uh, management practice for years. But, of course, when we're out scouting fields, rarely do we know what hybrids in those fields because we kind of pick them randomly. Well, we're not going to look a gift horse in the mouth here with regard to that disease, which is usually problematic in Kansas corn. However, you want to remind producers about some other possibilities by the same token, including one that can be confused, you say, with gray leaf spot, bacterial leaf streak. Right. So just as a a reminder, bacterial leaf uh, streak disease was first identified back in 2016 up in Nebraska, and since it's spread to about nine or ten states, um, it's caused by a a bacteria that originated as a sugarcane disease in South Africa, probably came to the United States, however, via Argentina, Probably from breeders' nurseries in the winters, uh, they picked it up and then brought it back with them because it it appears to some of us that uh, the initial infections were probably seed-borne, but now they've become well-established in many fields. Uh, Again, as a reminder, um, and this is not exclusive, but we're going to see most of the disease in continuous no-till corn that's under center pivot irrigation. So uh, here in Kansas, most of the disease is found out in the western third of the state. 
But having said that, we found it down in Labette County in Parsons at the experiment station down there in, in some corn research plots. We've found it in corn soybean rotated fields in Clay County and, and Butler County. Um, I just have a note from a, a consultant today that uh, they're going to ship me a sample from Ottawa County just north of Minneapolis. That county is not known to currently be infected. So uh, the disease is out there. Uh, we've had very favorable conditions both in Nebraska and Kansas. My counterpart in Nebraska is reporting uh, high levels of bacterial streak, and uh, I think we are starting to develop that. I've honestly not had a chance to go out to far western Kansas yet to uh, see for myself, but I've heard it is active in the Garden City area, for instance. And so uh, we don't honestly know if the disease itself causes any yield loss. Those experiments are in progress where we have inoculated versus uninoculated plots, and take them through to harvest and compare yields. Uh, so maybe by the end of this season, we'll have more data on that. But the, the key is, is, is that this disease, uh, to an untrained eye, can look very similar to gray leaf spot. And we know over the last uh, three or four years that people thought they had gray leaf spot, uh, went out and sprayed, uh, made that investment, and then saw no response to the fungicide application. Uh, that's because fungicides don't work on bacteria, and we don't have any bactericides really registered uh, or that would be economical to use. I guess coppers would, would work, but you'd have to make applications so frequently you might end up with copper toxicity. So it's, it's really not the way to go. So we're, we're, like uh, Goss's blight, we're going to probably manage this disease through hybrid selection over the years. But uh, uh, people need to be aware of the differences in the lesions. And I'll just real quickly... Mm-hmm. Gray leaf spot, the lesions are defined by the vein, so they have very sharp borders on them. Uh, they don't cross the vein. Uh, with bacterial leaf streak, they don't uh, respect that vein, and so they can have a wavy edge that crosses the border and comes back. Um, they tend to be very long and linear. And then uh, another key point, and a little hard to express this on, on the radio, but if you take a, a bacterial leaf streak infected leaf and a gray leaf spot infected leaf and hold them up side by side so they're backlit by the sun, that light will readily pass through the bacterial leaf streak lesion. We call that being translucent. Whereas for the gray leaf spot lesion, it doesn't pass through, so that lesion will look very dark brown. We call that opaque. And so that's one of the little diagnostic tools that you can use to tell the difference along with the, the shape of the lesion edges. So take that into account, growers, but by all means, make sure before you treat for gray leaf spot that it is actually gray leaf spot and not this other bacterial streak. And I would always just remind people that if they're not sure, they can always send samples in through their county extension office or directly to the K-State Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab here in Manhattan. We'd be glad to take a look at that. That'd be good confirmation. A couple of other things. Root lesion nematodes in corn, and again, below the surface. So what's the degree of activity right now there, Doug? Well, I haven't had any any direct reports here in 2019, but we know in 2018, especially up in far northeast Kansas in that Donovan Brown County area, they were very severe. I'm going to assume they haven't gone away in a single year. Uh, Some of those fields are in soybeans this year, but then some of the fields that were in soybeans last year may have equally high numbers of nematodes. We have a lot of late planted corn, so especially for later planted fields, it's not too late to check fields for root lesion nematode. Uh, just as a refresher, the best way to determine if you have a root lesion nematode is by what we would call a root bioassay. So they would actually dig up whole plants that are about 30 to 40 days past emergence, shake off the excess soil from the roots, um, and then send them on into the plant disease diagnostic lab. We incubate them for a week or so, and then we can do nematode counts. And you can get yield loss with you know, five to 10,000 nematodes per gram of root weight. Uh, last year, we had one sample came in at 100,000. So uh, we do have some very severely infected fields. Uh, we're still trying to determine how effective some of the seed treatment nematicides might be for this problem. If you have low levels of nematodes, they're, they're probably going to help. If you've got that 100,000 level, I'm not sure that that they'll be up to the task. And so uh, then we have to look at other things like primarily crop rotation. So uh, the earliest planted fields that are are starting to tassel, it's probably too late to check those. But 
just in the last week or two uh, over in the uh, Atchison area, I saw corn that was at V1. So fields that are that delayed, certainly there's plenty of time to get those in if you suspect you might have a problem. And obviously there's nothing you can do in a reactive sense to help this crop along. This is about hybrid selection and seed treatments. Right. And you're looking for stunted areas in the field, especially if they're starting to become a little chlorotic. Those would be make you suspicious that you might want to check for the, that area. All right. Well, let's finish on a soybean note. And it's been quite saturated out there, as everybody knows. We've had soybeans that have been even in standing water and struggling to get along. And you you say, Doug, that you actually saw frogs in soybeans prompting a question from a grower. Yeah, I was, so I was actually kind of oh, north of Solomon somewhere. I get on these back roads and I kind of lose track where I'm at. But there was a field that was very uh, yellow or chlorotic. And uh, so I wanted to stop and, and kind of check that out and, and take a picture. And the yellowing turned out to be a little mild iron chlorosis due, I think, to the overly wet soils. When we get soils that are, are near saturation and we don't have air around the roots, then sometimes they have trouble taking up those nutrients. Should be a minor problem. We get dried out and get some heat. Uh, they should recover from that. Sometimes the yellowing can be from the lack of nodules forming, again, due to the overly wet soils. But as I was out in the field to get my picture, I noticed that there were frogs hopping around. And, and uh, so curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to take a picture of it and, and send it out on Twitter and said, well, you know, you know it's been a wet year when there are frogs in the soybean fields, uh, which prompted a Twitter follower of mine to ask if that means we're going to have frog eye leaf spot this year. And as I thought about it, the answer it definitely could be yes, because frog eye leaf spot is going to be favored by wet weather. Uh, we certainly had plenty of that. If it would especially continue into July here now, uh, this could be a very above average year for frog eye leaf spot, as was last year. So there's probably in many fields a lot of inoculum around. So uh, the answer to that question was yes, <laughs> or stay tuned. Very good. And soybean growers, the note there is be looking for frog eye leaf spot, those indicating symptoms that that disease might be at work in your stands as well. Well, Doug, undoubtedly, we'll have you back again to talk more about disease activity in our row crops as we move forward throughout the balance of this summer. Appreciate your time as always. You're welcome. Doug Jardine, row crop disease specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today returns shortly with more on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Now we have more information for you from the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State and more directly, it's Land Use Survey Center. This is the Blue Stem Pasture Report for 2019. And what that's all about will be explained by the director of that center over from Agricultural Economics, Leah Sudel. She's going to share some information telling you what this survey is all about. And let's just get right to that, Leah, the purpose of this survey. How do you see it being useful? What is it conducted for? It is conducted to provide public information on lease rates in the blue stem pasture area for folks who aren't in the thick of things, who may be new to the area, who are thinking about changing their lease, or maybe they're getting a lease in a different county. This kind of gives them a benchmark to start their lease negotiations from. Now, this is a project coordinated by K-State along with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Yes. It's a joint effort, and it's it been has, around for a while, hasn't it? It has been around for a very long time. It was dropped briefly. It was conducted by uh, the National Ag Statistics Service back when they had a Kansas office in Topeka, and then it became cost prohibitive, and we pitched Kansas Department of Agriculture and uh, have taken it up. It was, it was one of those surveys that was too important 
to users for Department of Ag to drop. They really wanted to pursue it. Now, the survey geographically covers the blue stem pasture area. Mm-hmm. That more or less reflects the Flint Hills, does it not? True. Yes. 14 counties are encompassed in what we call the blue stem pasture area. And I'm not going to bore you with it. There's a <laughs> list in the report that is on agmanager.info of the 14 counties that it is specific to when we survey in, within those counties. And those are very important when it comes to grassland resources in the state. A very Obviously. large portion of the pasture is encompassed in that area. They also, though, sort of set the tone for leases around the state, even though it's not in blue stem pasture area per se, that lends to the importance of this, does it not? Agreed. Yes. This year's survey was conducted slightly differently from years past. How so, Leah? We completely revamped the survey instrument or the survey format. We had folks who approached me and said, this isn't answering the questions that we need it to answer out in the country. And so I got a focus group of folks together that were included landowners and livestock owners, livestock care providers, and some Flint Hills extension agents to see what they wanted. I guess they had approached the previous survey providers about changing it and nothing was ever done and they really wanted to see this change and so we took all of their information and completely revamped uh, the survey format and then took the format to the countryside per yep. se. and what sorts of things and here we get into the content were you asking about the types of leases would be a starting point there, various we kinds? ask for short summer leases, full summer leases, three-quarter summer leases, full year leases, and winter grazing. Those were the five types. We gave them a list, a laundry list of potential care services that might be provided, and I think it was around 11 services that might be provided with options to write in if there was something that wasn't on the list. I shortened the survey up quite a bit, just kind of giving them the options. If they'd selected any of those care options, then that rental rate was considered a with care Mm -hmm. rental rate. And just so folks will know, when we're talking care services, such things as fence maintenance or providing mineral, counting animals out there on behalf of the owner, you tried to capture all of that in that list. Right. That was one of the biggest feelings from the focus group was that we really didn't get an idea of what that lease rate entailed. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to capture what really went into that dollar figure per acre or dollar figure per animal head. So So you've cross-referenced all of this and come up with some numbers, which we won't walk through in detail today because there's quite a volume of those. But it gives folks an idea of how all of that dovetails together for particular leasing arrangements then. Yes. You looked at the length of leases, too, and said you found something interesting there, Leah? We did, and it's a standard question that we ask with all of our lease surveys. And interestingly enough, I think 60-some-odd percent of the leases of our respondents were re-upped annually, and that, that's not normally what I find. Normally, I find that most people have been in their leases for many years and renegotiating a lease is not generally not what people's favorite thing to do right. and so that surprised me that they said that it was done annually and it may just be that it's not a long drawn out formal uh, negotiation of it they may be maybe they just tweak it once a year or something like that interestingly aligned yeah. with that the breakdown of written versus oral leases is very close to 50-50 mm-hmm. is that surprising Um, We're seeing that more and more. I think that the written has begun to creep up in the leasing surveys that I've seen. You know, years ago, you would have a handshake lease. But now, more and more, especially with absentee landowners, things like that, you're seeing shift to more written leases. Everything's put in black and white. 
Mm. And especially, it's especially important when you do come into these care services and things that you've got it broken down what, what is going to be provided but for that lease right. It covers all the contingencies on what's supposed right. to be done by whom in that arrangement. And again, you've all those care categories considered here. You've uh, this, as far as rates go, broken down by lighter calves, heavier calves, cow-calf pairs. So you really have captured all of the possibilities or as many as possible in that respect, have you not, Leah? Well, actually, part of the survey change was instead of having multiple weight categories for the stalkers, we just said we're going to look at, and this came from the focus group as well, and they said, hey, we just want to look at what's – kind of an average animal unit and we came to the conclusion of a 600 pound animal and what's your rate on that and that would kind of help people who are active in the lease market to be able to translate their lease rate however by pound or they could do it by acre and that way it's just one standard unit mm-hmm. of animal so, and then we had cow calf, and we determined that to be a twelve hundred and fifty pound okay. unit. So that uh, makes it maybe more straightforward for folks comparing apples to apples. Yes, here, a lot of exactly. Yeah. That's and that was really the ultimate goal of redoing the whole thing was to was to make it comparable apples to apples. There's one more facet to this we want to mention, and in fact, you say, Leah, this will be explored even further. But part of the report gets an idea of what it costs to build fence in the blue yes. stem pasture area. But again, maybe this could be extrapolated elsewhere and won't get into the numbers deeply here, but this lists what uh, folks could expect if they needed fence built to whatever degree. Right. And, and like I say, it's the same thing as with the lease rates. You may not find one specific lease that is exactly that number or one specific fence builder that's exactly that number, but it gives you a, a good idea of of what's a reasonable quote and what might be a little bit out there for your area. And then you have it even broken down further in that as far as with materials, without materials, right. labor only, so on. So it really gives folks a handle or at least a notion of what those costs are going to be. Right, and right. So you can kind of have an idea before you go and start shopping for your fence. And you say you're That's going a to... big expense. <laughs> it is. A, and getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to look at that aspect further, you say? We are. We're also, we've been simultaneously conducting the Kansas Pasture Survey, which is all across Kansas and not just limited to the 14 Bluestem counties. And we ask fencing cost questions in that as well. And so that report will be coming out in a couple of months. Also, we'll be on Ag Manager. All of our stuff from the Youth Survey Center is under the Land and Leasing tabs. There's a Land Use Research tab on Ag Manager. And everything that we produce can be found there. And so our our fencing costs that will encompass the entire state, that report will be out there in a couple of months. But for the here and now, the report on the Blue Stem Pasture Survey 2019 is right there at agmanager.info. Start with the land and leasing tab, and then you can easily find the survey results from there. Absolutely. Very good information for folks to take in as they manage their grasslands, particularly in that region. But even those outside of that Flint Hills area might be quite interested in what this report has to say, Leo. Thanks for sharing a few highlights, and congratulations on putting another fine survey together. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with you about it. Leah Sudel with us. She is the director of the Land Use Survey Center in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. This survey report is just out, just posted for your review at agmanager.info. This is Agriculture Today. We'll be back in a few moments with more for you on this, the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. After being extraordinarily slow out of the gate, the Kansas wheat harvest has been at full steam of late, and that's indicated in the weekly crop progress and condition report from the USDA. For the week ending this past Sunday, our top soil moisture supplies, 12% surplus, 83% adequate, 5% short to very short, subsoil moisture, 13% surplus, 84% adequate, and only 3% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop, 55% good to excellent, 29% fair, 16% poor to very poor, and the harvest now at 28% complete as of this past weekend, still well behind the 61% for the five-year average on the date. Corn crop condition is at 52% good to excellent, 35% fair, and 13% poor to very poor. Soybean conditions at 45% good to excellent, 44% fair, and 11% poor to very poor. By the way, soybean planting now 91% complete. That's nearly average. And grain sorghum conditions around the state 68% good to excellent, 29% fair, and 3% poor to very poor. For a look at the national status of corn and soybeans, we go to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Ribby has a look at corn emergence. We did see emergence moving forward to 94%. That, of course, is behind the five-year average and last year's numbers 100%. He says there is a lot of corn left to emerge in the southern and eastern Corn Belt states. In Ohio, for example, just 83% emerged. Five-year average is 100%. Meanwhile, with corn condition... Effectively no change, a little mixing up in the categories, but if you lump good to excellent together, no change at 56% in that in those two categories. No change in the very poor-to-poor rating at 12%. That is unfavorably compared to last year's numbers, which were 76% good to excellent and just 6% very poor-to-poor. The states with notable poor ratings include Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Soybean planting is nearing completion. 92% of the soybeans planted by June 30th, well behind the five-year average of 99% and last year's 100%. The five states that still have at least 10% of the crop soybeans left to plant, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, and Ohio. Soybean emergence also is behind schedule. From what has been put in the ground moving forward from 71% last week to the current reading on June 30th of 80 Delays in planting and emergence are reflected in the crop's condition. Just 54% of the soybeans rated good to excellent on June 30th, no change from last week. 11% very poor to poor, that is up a point from last week. And like corn, that compares unfavorably to last year when we were at 71% good to excellent and just 6% very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This being a Tuesday, we bring you now the weekly feature for you dairy producers, Milk Lines, with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Now, Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning, well, the recent rise in feed prices due to some weather conditions here in Kansas as well as across uh, most of the Midwest and even on toward the East Coast. We've had some delays in the planting of the corn crop and a bit of a delay in planting of soybeans as well. As a result of that, we've seen a rise in corn and soybean prices. This is increasing our feed costs on our dairies, and we're not sure exactly how long this might continue in the future. I do listen to what the grain marketers are saying, and some are thinking that maybe we've seen a high point uh, for corn prices, so maybe we'll see these prices recede back a little bit as we get more favorable weather for both planting and growing of the summer crops. But as a dairy farmer, you need to keep an eye on this and start planning what you're going to do for the fall, winter, and into even 2020. So if you're working with a person who helps you with bidding feeds as well as contracting feeds as well as marketing, I encourage you to work closely with them over the next few months as we watch these prices go up and down according to what we have for weather scares. Could be an opportunity for you on the feeding side to lock in some cheaper feeds and also protect yourself from the potential of significantly higher feed costs. But again, you need to probably work with a marketing professional as you try to work through those issues. I I know many of you do, but just encourage you that these changes tend to 
be fairly volatile and we don't necessarily have a lot of days to take advantage when we do have a favorable situation that develops. So that's on the grain side. What do you need to be thinking about on the forage side? Well, we're forecasted to probably have maybe a cooler summer is what the long range forecast is looking like. Right now we have ample water supplies over most of the region so hopefully uh, we can produce a lot of forage although it may be a challenge to get that forage harvested in a timely manner and also get it harvested without having it rained on and just know many of you have experienced this with your first and second cutting alfalfa very very difficult uh, harvest windows that we've had to look at so what should we be thinking about as we move down this road well supply is a key thing that you need to really keep a focus on. So know where you're at currently on supplies on hand, where you need to be for the next 12 to 16 months. And then as you have opportunity, how are you going to fill those needs that you have for the next 12 to 16 months in a timely manner, but also in an efficient manner in terms of the prices that you're paying. Keeping in mind that we can never exactly predict what the growing conditions are going to be, so yields of forages sometimes may not be quite as much as what we expect. One of the things that we do need to consider probably is what we're going to do for available bedding, particularly straw. Straw may not be an an ample supply this year in many areas of the state. As a result of that, we may need to look at some alternatives for bedding. One of the opportunities would be corn stalks, but you need to plan ahead for that, keeping in mind that corn stalks maybe are not as excellent of bedding as what straw is. But in some areas, like bedded packs, as well as when we need to bed animals in open lots, it may serve a way to conserve the straw. Put down a layer of stalks first and then straw on top so we use less straw. But I would encourage you to secure your straw supplies early in the season this year just to make sure that you have enough available for bedding. If we have a wet summer, will we have a wet winter? Well, that's anybody's guess at this point. We know that if we have a lot of wet weather in the winter, we're going to have an increased need for bedding. So plan ahead to make sure that you have an ample supply on your dairy. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging the dairy farmers to start planning for feed and bedding needs for the upcoming year. Good input, Mike. Many thanks. We'll return with K-State's Charlie Lee shortly here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Agriculture Today is back now, and once again we welcome in Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, for a look at another aspect of wildlife management. Charlie, the problem that you highlight this week, feral dogs causing trouble out across uh, parts of the countryside. At times, feral dogs or dogs with owners that do not confine their domestic dogs cause problems for people. The number of Maulings of people, including young children, uh, is well defined in the literature. But it's also a problem when they attack wildlife or livestock. In appearance, feral dogs are difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish from domestic dogs. But we need to make sure that a feral dog really is not a dog that just happens to be loose for a short period of time. Uh, Many counties or cities have rules and restrictions on allowing dogs to run free, but it's still difficult to tell by looking at the dog. Does that dog have an owner or not? Is there a way to distinguish by the behavior of that dog or how they socialize with other dogs? What? Well, the behavior is is quite a little bit different the way they act towards people. Domestic dogs typically are going to be friendly, wag their tails, or be somewhat calm. 
But feral dogs are more aggressive, often will uh, growl and bark or attempt to bite or run away from people. But one feature that distinguishes feral dogs from domestic dogs is their degree of reliance or dependence on humans. Feral dogs survive and reproduce independently without uh, human intervention or assistance. They scavenge or prey on wildlife or domestic animals for food, and just like other wild canids do. Their tracks look the same. Their outward appearance is the same. They're widespread. Feral dogs occur worldwide. They occur wherever people are present and permit dogs to run roam free or where people abandon unwanted dogs. Do they prefer any specific habitat whatsoever? Well, they're typically found in more an habitat that provides more concealment. That often is forested areas, woodlands, shrublands, areas where they can get out of human view in a short period of time. Many people don't tolerate feral dogs in close proximity to humans, but we still have feral dogs uh, that are in around the edges of small communities or even larger cities. And do they tend to run in packs, such as, say, coyotes would? Yes, they seem to be a more social group and are more highly organized in packs than just a group of domestic dogs would be. So what is the degree of damage we see to livestock from feral dog predation, if you will? Well, typically the, the problems is um, they are not very efficient at killing. So there's often a lot of bite marks, uh, slashing and biting. But some feral dogs become very proficient at killing, and they take down domestic livestock just uh, as well as wild uh, canines like coyotes or wolves would. The same way on other species of wildlife, deer is a primary target of feral dogs, small animals, but they also will consume a wide range of food items like watermelons and cantaloupes. Um, Those things are typically eaten by feral dogs as well. So then what can a landowner do to uh, try to prevent feral dogs from creating any form of damage here? Well, the first thing, uh, like all wildlife damage problems, is try to put some sort of barrier between what you want to protect and the predator trying to get it. So that would be some sort of a net fence that's well-maintained, tight to the ground, uh, at least five feet in height, uh, reduce uh, dogs being able to get through it. Frightening devices like yard lights and music and pyrotechnics seem to only work for a short period of time. Guardian dogs uh, typically don't work very well either, but can be utilized in some situations because some guardian dogs are quite efficient at at keeping feral dogs away from livestock. Uh, So typically it's um, a cage trap or foothold traps that are used or shooting as a means of controlling these feral dogs. Now, you do point out that on the latter option shooting, the law has something to say about how that can be legally conducted. Well, in Kansas, uh, killing dogs is lawful when they're found injuring or attempting to injure any livestock. Now, the definition of livestock is very specific. It includes cattle, bison, swine, sheep, goats, horses, mules, domesticated deer, domestic poultry, uh, including waterfowl, as well as ostriches, emus, and rheas. So keep in mind that this does not include publicly owned wildlife. So it's killing a dog is lawful when they're injuring or attempting to injure livestock in Kansas. There's a very similar statute in most states. That applies to domestic as well as feral dogs then, right? Yes, it says if any dog. Uh, the, the liability of the owner of a dog for damages, uh, if this is a owned dog rather than a true feral dog, the parties um, can go to court, and that owner of the dog creating problems can be liable for damages. So that puts the onus on for those with domesticated animals being responsible owners of dogs. Well, we'd like to think that people would be more responsible in taking care of animals to keep it from injuring people or damaging property. 
But in rural areas, that means you got to stop that dog from attacking or bothering your neighbor's livestock. When that happens, there's just simply two basic rules. The livestock owners may kill the marauding dogs, and they won't be liable, or the dog owners are financially responsible for the damage that their dogs may cause. So a good point to keep in mind, but back to feral dogs, a difficult problem to contend with, it sounds. It's a problem that takes some finesse. It's uh, a situation that often doesn't end well, particularly when there are owners of dogs involved because no one wants their dog destroyed. But unfortunately, that seems to be a a solution uh, that's utilized most frequently. There's some background on the problem and what limited things can be done to control livestock damage and other damage created by feral dogs. Charlie, thanks for the information on this. Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee with us. Well, our time's away for today. Again, thanks for being along with us, and please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.